the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Christ is in our midst. He is in Do you know the man? The man who is sitting outside the gate, full of sores, hungry, and alone. Do you know him? You see, in today's gospel, we have something very unique as far as parables go. Someone has a name. If you think of the other parables, the prodigal son, the good Samaritan, the ten virgins, the sower, and so on, we don't have any names. But today we do. Someone is known, right? We hear of the rich man, who is nameless, and Lazarus, who is known, who is recognized by God, who is delivered into the bosom of Abraham. But we don't hear a whole lot about either of these two men. Right? The rich man was clothed in purple and fine linen. He feasted daily. Lazarus was poor and hungry, full of sores, and at the rich man's gate. But I want us to think what would happen if Lazarus was fed and he was ministered to. If he were given even just crumbs, like he desired, it would mean that there was also an interaction, a connection with another human being. You see, the rich man's sin is not that he was rich, it's not that he ate well, it's not that he dressed well. It's that he ignored his brother who was right in front of him. He didn't know the man. The only life that mattered was his own. He effectively says to Lazarus, I do not know you, I don't care to know you. You're dead to me, your existence doesn't matter. And as we learn in the scriptures, when this is said, it's not really just said to Lazarus, but it's also said to Christ. I was interviewing someone for uh, camp this past summer, and one of the questions I asked them was, how do you live your faith out in your day-to-day life? And one of the things this person said was, I try to see the person who is unseen. I try to see the person who is unseen. Effectively, we could say this person tries to see Lazarus, right? They try to know the man at the gate. They try to see Christ. And most of the time, we go about our days distracted, hurried, kind of tunnel vision, right? We're often busy, but we're not necessarily active and present in those moments. We have our plans, we have our stuff that kind of clouds our day, and most of which aren't bad in and of themselves, right? But it often makes us blind to see the person who is standing right in front of us, right? Or if we see that they're there, they might be an inconvenience, unless they fall into our routine, right? We're around people all the time, but most of the time we're probably not present with them. Someone once told me that one of the hardest things in life is being with someone or a group of people and still feeling totally alone. And some of us may have felt this way before. So the question is, are we willing to set aside our plans, our routines, our expectations, to truly see the person who is right in front of us? Are we willing to set aside our plans to truly see Christ standing right in front of us? If we begin to pause for this human interaction, we invite God to act right then and there. And this moment becomes not just a human interaction, but a divine one. God is present. God is there. God is working. That sacrifice to be truly present with someone, that self-emptying, that connection, that communion, allows God to reveal himself to us and to them, through us and through them. If you want to witness your faith to somebody, truly be with them. That's one of the most Christ-like things we can do. It allows us to know our neighbor, it allows us to know God, which in turn allows us to know ourselves. So we have to ask ourselves, are we willing not just to sit with our neighbor, but are we willing to sit with Christ? That's what this is about, or is he also one of our inconveniences? Are we willing to see him present in front of us? So we have to ask, do we really believe in him? Do we believe that he's alive in us, in our neighbor? Or is he just a man in a storybook? Christ tells us in the scriptures, again, that when we minister uh, to our neighbor or we ignore our neighbor, We do that very thing to Christ, right? The rich man ignored Christ at the gate. In today's gospel, Abraham tells the rich man that those who ignore Moses and the prophets and the scriptures wouldn't be convinced to repent even if someone were to rise from the dead. And we see this play out. 
This is the very thing that talk, gets talked about in the scriptures, right? Christ healed people. He fed the multitude. He raised the dead. He rose himself. He is everything the scriptures talked about. And people still were in disbelief. And some chose to disbelieve. Why? Because it challenged them, right? It was an inconvenience to their expectations. Christ flipped the whole world upside down. The Son of God, the Savior, our Lord, in all of his glory, becomes just a humble man. He was tempted, he hungered, he felt pain, he cried. He was betrayed by a friend. He was nailed to the cross and experienced death. The Son of God died on the cross. He flipped the whole world upside down. So can we also flip the world upside down? Can we change our expectations and our routines? Of course, this is what repentance is all about. Realigning ourselves with Christ, regardless of the discomfort that that can bring us. Much of Christ's life was about embracing single moments, revealing truth by being present right then and there, one moment at a time. And so do we embrace those moments? Do we invite Christ into those moments? We say Christ is in our midst. We say Christ is risen. But do we see Christ in that person that we're saying these things to? Right? Christ is in our midst. He's here. He's alive. He's right in front of us. And we often ask, where is God? But we ignore him. But if we seek, we will find. Right? When we say Christ is in our midst in just a little bit and we turn to each other, seek him. See Christ in the person right there who you are making this proclamation embrace that moment now if we go around and try to kiss people in our day-to-day -day lives cops may be called on us so maybe that's not the best way to go uh maybe taken a little too far too soon but and maybe even if we say christ is in our midst to everyone that we come about maybe that may come off a little strong i i don't know but what happens if we start to quietly pray this christ is in our midst because that is a prayer what if we begin to pray this before our encounters with others? What happens if we proclaim this reality, not just in the divine liturgy on Sundays, but in the liturgy of our day-to-day -day life? Because our life is liturgy, right? Our life is sacramental. It's work in which we seek to be in communion with God and communion with our neighbor. Our life seeks divine interaction and sanctification. If we say this prayer, Christ is in our midst, we invite God to work here and now. Our eyes begin to open and allows us to encounter Christ in our neighbor. We acknowledge the divine presence of God here and now. And of course, this isn't easy, otherwise we'd be doing it already. It's going to be uncomfortable for most of us. It'll challenge us. And that's okay. Maybe when we're feeding the hungry, we seek to recognize that there's actually a human being there. right? Not just a hand that's reaching out that we're filling with money or food, but recognizing there's a person made in the image and likeness of God. In school, maybe it means that we're engaging with more than just our friend base, right? Which means sacrificing some time with our friends, not all of the time, but some of the time to cultivate new relationships. At work, it can mean to pause to encounter your coworker or a customer, right? which may in reality result in staying another 10 minutes when you're tired and ready to be home. And maybe that's a sacrifice we need to make. At the grocery store, something as simple as that, seeing the checkout clerk as not just someone who's there to serve you, but as someone made in the image and likeness of God. On a walk, it means not pulling out our phones right away to avoid eye contact with the person walking by us. I do that several times. <laughs> But to actually see the person, to engage with that person, it doesn't have to be a 10 minute conversation, it doesn't have to be a 10 second conversation, but that connection right then and there. Especially after the last two years, we've probably gotten really comfortable with being disengaged with each other. And maybe before then we were still weren't that great at it. To engage with people can be uncomfortable. Christ's crucifixion was beyond uncomfortable, and it was the result of him engaging with his creation. But through his crucifixion, 
Through the uncomfortable, joy comes into all the world. Through it, there is salvation. And our neighbor is our salvation. Through those moments with our neighbor, joy can come into all the world. Through those moments with our neighbor, a salvific act takes place right then and there. It's uncomfortable, and maybe even in the beginning, it doesn't feel authentic when we try to have those moments. And that's okay. A Saint Ambrose of Optina uh, encourage us. He says that if you find that there is no love in you, but you want to have it, then do deeds of love, even though you do them without love in the beginning. The Lord will see your desire and striving and will put love in your heart. And that's what this is all about. Learning to love our neighbor, learning to love God, and not just our neighbor who fits into our schedule, not just God when he fits into our schedule. Our lives are about transformation, growth, becoming more and more Christ-like so that it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Aligning ourselves with the will of God. Christ ate with sinners, and of course we're sinners as well, but for us maybe that can mean spending time with somebody we don't necessarily agree with, but not for the sake of arguing with them, but just being with them. Christ found the woman with the issue of blood in the crowd. Right? For us that can mean seeing that person who is unseen. Being the one to connect with the person who is ignored, who is outcast. Seeing the man at the gate. Even in our homes, we can probably be more intentional about the time we spend with our family and our friends. May we seek to know the man at the gate. But we don't just seek to know the man at the gate, we seek to be the man at the gate. Right? Lazarus hungered, he sought to be at the table. He was a humble man who just desired life. May we have that same humble hunger and desire as we seek to know God and we seek to know each other. May we hunger for life itself as we approach the chalice in just a little bit and receive the bread of life. May we seek to know the man at the gate and become the man at the gate. Embrace the uncomfortable. Embrace the little moments. See Christ in the person who is standing right in front of you. And allow God to work. Amen. Christ is in our midst. He is in our midst.